It appears like the powers that shouldn't be have decided to temporarily end their overt, tyrannical, domestic policies in a couple of countries. Now, I'm not sure if it's because of the pushback they received in those countries, or because, like I said, it's only a temporary end to their tyranny, or because they don't have the deaths to justify further tyranny, or any of the other many other possibilities. Who knows? Maybe it's because they realize too many people are actually catching on to what's really happening. However, this video isn't about why these governments are temporarily ending some of their COVID policies. It's about why we shouldn't allow the pressure on these governments to end at the end of their COVID mandates. These governments, all of them, have already done enough to show that they are part of a criminal cartel, and they have already done enough using this system to prove that this system, this constitution, doesn't really protect us, and this constitution, of course, all of those other countries' constitutions. Like, I can't believe that Canada, Australia, and many of these other countries don't have free speech. Like, they don't actually have free speech. It's like there should be a revolution just over that. But I guess that's what happens when most people are asleep. But yeah, they have already done enough to prove that they are part of a criminal cartel and that these constitutions and that this system that we're working with these sorts of democracies have a very long history of not only failing to protect us and our liberties from tyranny and despotism, but of actually being the very agent or the very reason that such abuses were allowed to occur to begin with. Like these constitutions have actually empowered these criminals and these criminals have actually used these constitutions and these and these sorts of democracies, I'm sure that there might be a type of democracy out there that, that can work, but they have used these sorts of democracies to actually empower themselves and to carry out their abuses. Now, I've gone over such instances of corruption before, but they've mostly been on the macroscopic scale of things, on the federal level and on the global level. So in this video, I'm going to present a relatively microscopic case of a historically accepted instance of widespread corruption and conspiracy that went on for over 150 years. Now this is historically accepted. This, what I am mentioning in this video is a fact. And the funny thing is that it's such a fact that I actually learned about this, or I was first introduced to this, in a history class that I took while getting my associate's degree. However, I'm not gonna go over all of the stuff that I learned in that class. Instead, I'm just going to cover this New York Post article titled, The Strange Birth of New York's Gun Laws. Now, despite being in the opinion section, this article is actually full with a lot of factual gems. So let's check it out. Recent months have seen a former Marine from Indiana a Tea Party activist from California, and a nurse from Tennessee, all arrested and charged in New York City for possession of firearms they had legal permits to carry back home. All were nabbed when they naively sought to check the weapon with security. It should have said, check their weapon with security. But whatever. These innocents fell afoul of the nation's toughest gun laws. But few New Yorkers know how those laws came to be. I would say few people in general know how these laws came to be. The father of New York gun control was Democratic City Poll Big Tim Sullivan, a state senator, and Tammany Hall Crook, a criminal overseer of the gangs of New York. All right, before we go into what the father of New York gun control did in New York to pass these gun control laws, I want to quickly discuss, and when I say quickly, I mean I want to discuss this for a couple of minutes. I want to quickly discuss Tammany Hall and the gangs of New York. So I'm going to be basing my discussion on this Tammany Hall article that I believe was posted on ThoughtCo, thoughtco.com or whatever. So Tammany Hall, New York City's political machine was the home to legendary corruption. 
and I mean, I mean, legendary on the most legendary of legendary scales of corruption. So this article is by Robert McNamara, and it was originally published or maybe updated on April 5th, 2019. So Tammany Hall, or simply Tammany, was the name given to a powerful political machine that essentially ran New York City throughout much of the 19th century. Now here I highlighted the where it says essentially ran New York City throughout much of the 19th century because that's exactly what they did. I mean, they had top to bottom control of New York City. Like it's crazy how corrupt and how much power was behind this organization. And we're, I'm gonna prove that using history. So the organization reached a peak of notoriety in the decade following the Civil War when it harbored the ring, the corrupted political organization of Boss Tweed. After the scandals of the Tweed years, Tammany continued to dominate New York City politics and spawned such characters as Richard Crocker, who may have killed a political opponent in his youth, and George Washington Plunkett, who defended what he termed honest graft. The Society of St. Tammany, which was also called the Columbian Order, was founded in May 1789. Some sources say 1786. The sources that say uh, 1786 are the correct ones. The organization took its name from Tamend, a legendary indigenous chief in the American Northeast who was said to have had friendly dealings with William Penn in the 1680s. The original purpose of the Tammany Society was for discussion of politics in the new nation. The club was organized with titles and rituals based quite loosely on indigenous lore. For instance, the leader of Tammany was known as the Grand Sachem, and the club's headquarters was known as the Wigwam. Before long, the Society of St. Tammany turned into a distinct political organization affiliated with Aaron Burr, a powerful force in New York politics at the time. Now, before I move on, I just want to say a couple of things. I want to just quickly mention uh, what it said about the club's original purpose and the club becoming a distinct political organization when it became affiliated with Aaron Burr. So the first thing that I want to say is that the reason why they come up with this idea that it was founded in 1789, in May 1789, is because that was after New York had ratified the Constitution. So that's after the new nation had already formed. So then that allows them to come up with this idea that it was originally for discussing politics in the new nation. But the reality is a little different. And the reality is, is that it was, it had corrupt roots. It was actually created as a political organization or as a club for discussing politics, but more so for propagating politics. And the Tammany Society, the Tammany Club, actually had a huge role with disseminating the propaganda surrounding the Constitution and getting the Constitution ratified. They had a huge hand in that whole process. So I just want to put that out there. And then the other thing that I wanted to say I wanted to connect this use of indigenous lore, this use of using um, these indigenous names like the Grand Sachem, to the things that they do at Bohemian Grove and to the things that the KKK does. It's very interesting that this was a democratic affiliated organization. The, the Tammany Club was associated with the Democratic Party, as was the KKK. And I just wanted to say it's almost like these Democrats they really are as crazy and out of their mind as they appear to be. Like, I mean, these people, they seem like people who put on costumes when they're alone and act completely different when they're alone. And, you know, they have a long history of doing exactly that. Let's move back to the information about Tammany. Let's learn a little bit about Aaron Burr. Now, some of you might know who Aaron Burr is. 
because he's the guy who shot and killed Alexander Hamilton in an illegal duel. However, an interesting thing is this guy, Aaron Burr, heavily connected to the club. He was, I believe, the third vice president to the United States. And this guy was so connected to the club that after he shot and killed Hamilton in an illegal duel, all of the charges against him were actually dropped. So let's go back to Tammany. In the early 1800s, Tammany often sparred with New York's governor, D. Witt Clinton, and there were cases of early political corruption that came to light. In the 1820s, the leaders of Tammany threw their support behind Andrew Jackson's quest for the presidency. Tammany leaders met with Jackson before his election in 1828, promised their support, and when Jackson was elected, they were rewarded in what became known as the spoils system with federal jobs in New York City. Now, we have to stop right there and we have to take a look at this spoil system because it's going to reveal a lot about the politics in New York at the time. Of course, this also reveals a lot about politics on the federal level, but it reveals a lot more about politics in New York because this spoil system, you'll see, already existed inside of New York and basically Tammany exported this spoil system into the White House, or the White House under Andrew Jackson decided to import this policy. And of course, it's not like these individuals, you know, it's the club in general doing this. You know, the club in general seeing like, okay, how do we get a footing? How do we get a corrupt footing of control? And they, they saw how it was working in New York, and they said, okay, well, look, clearly we have total control in New York, so let's export this to the White House and basically spread it around the nation. And you'll see that's exactly what they did. So let's look at this article. I believe this is also a Thought Co. article. Yeah, it is actually. So the spoils system, definition and summary. I'm sorry, guys, it's going to be a long video, lots of talking, but lots of information. Intended as a reform under Jackson... When Andrew Jackson took office in March 1829, after the bruising election of 1828, he was determined to change the way the federal government operated. And, as might be expected, he ran into considerable opposition. Jackson was by nature very suspicious of his political opponents. As he took office, he was still quite angry at his predecessor, John Quincy Adams. The way Jackson saw things, the federal government was full of people who were opposed to him. When Jackson felt that some of his initiatives were being blocked, he became incensed. His solution was to come up with an official program to remove people from federal jobs and replace them with employees considered loyal to his administration. Other administrations going back to... Actually, before I move on, I just want to say that this is the mainstream take of things. You know, this is what they feed to the sheep to get the sheep to buy the, the BS. You know, what it was is that the club had an issue. The club, not only did they have an issue, but they want to get more of a footing. The club saw that they had power or that they had the potential of power, which was these federal positions. And they realized that they could basically sell those positions. They can use those positions as a pawning token and that's exactly what they wanted. So they had to create a controversy. They had to create a drama to then create a need to give them control over those positions. They're saying, oh yeah, we have to avoid this drama. It's making so that the government can't function. You know, we need a government that can function. So we need to give the government more power. We need to give the government power to fire these people and hire their own people. And that's exactly what happened. Other administrations, going back to that of George Washington, had hired loyalists, of course, but under Jackson, the purging of people thought to be political opponents became official policy. So they should have made this a little bit more clear. Basically, what it's saying is like, yes, when they were given the opportunity to hire, they hired people who were loyal to them. But they didn't go around firing people who they thought weren't loyal to them and then hiring people who they thought were loyal to them. You know, this system of corruption didn't exist. 
But after Andrew Jackson, who was supported by this super corrupt political organization in New York, after he got into office, he changed things to mirror and to match the type of corruption or the, the type of politics that existed in New York at the time. And we're going to see that right now. Spoil systems denounced as corruption. They are. Jackson's policy of replacing federal employees was bitterly denounced by his political opponents, but they were essentially powerless to fight against it. Jackson's political ally and future president, Martin Van Buren, was at times credited with having created the new policy, as his New York political machine, known as the Albany Regency, had operated in a similar fashion. Okay, I'm sorry. So, this policy didn't come directly from Tammany. But as you can see, Martin Van Buren, he was connected with another New York political machine who operated under this manner. And the thing is, is they're all little offshoots of each other. Like Tammany, I'm sure they were connected with this Albany Regency. I'm sure they were all very well connected. It's just Tammy operated and controlled things in New York City. Published reports in the 19th century claim that Jackson's policy accounted for nearly 700 government officers losing their jobs in 1829, the first year of his presidency. In July 1829, a newspaper report claiming the mass firing of federal employees actually affected the economy of the city of Washington, with merchants unable to sell goods. Brilliant. The Democrats have been screwing up the economy since uh, 1829. That may have been exaggerated, but there is no doubt that Jackson's policy was controversial. In January 1832, Jackson's perennial enemy, Henry Clay, became involved. He assailed Senator Marcy of New York in a Senate debate, accusing the loyal Jacksonian of bringing corrupt practices from the New York political machine to Washington. In his exasperated retort to Clay, Marcy defended the Albany Regency, declaring, quote, they see nothing wrong in the rule that the victor belongs the spoils. Now this is ridiculous rhetoric because it's creating this like war type rhetoric when it's not simply about like, oh look, the victor gets the spoils. This is corruption that is bad for the entire country. Okay, so that covers the spoil system, but we have to say a couple more things about Tammany. So I'm going to return back to the Thought Co. Tammany article. With Tammany associated with the Jacksonians and the Democratic Party, the organization was viewed as friendly to the working people. When waves of immigrants, especially from Ireland, arrived in New York City, Tammany became associated with the immigrant vote. So I just have to digress and say a couple of things here. So I find it incredible. I mean, these, these Democrats, they have a very long history of using the government to give out handouts in order to gain political power. And what really bothers me is that people, most people, not all people, most people, they think in such a superficial way that they can't see how these handouts, they can't see how this government assistance, this government aid, actually ends up harming the country in the long run. And not just the country, but all of the people in the country in the long run as well. Now, I'm not saying there shouldn't be any government assistance to anybody ever at any times under any circumstances. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that there's a major problem with our current system. And there's definitely a major problem with this spoils system, which is most of the type of help that, you know, they gave out. Now, the next thing that I want to say, I'm going to wait for after I read this next sentence. In the 1850s, Tammany was becoming a powerhouse of Irish politics in New York City. And in the time before social welfare programs, Tammany politicians generally provided the only help the poor could get. Now there's a lot, so much, just so much history and information that needs to be discussed here. But under their control, these political machines created basically all of these civil service jobs that we know today. So the thing is, they had this corruption in the federal government. They had this spoil system 
going on in like the main government and like the operating government. But they needed more jobs. They needed more jobs. They needed more power that they had control over that they could dish out to people to get even more political power. So they had this idea of, hey, we have these federal jobs, we have these state jobs, you know, these politician jobs. Let's create more state jobs. Let's create civil service jobs. And under them, the NYPD was formed, the FDNY was formed, and, and law enforcement organizations all over the country were formed with this idea in mind. Okay, that's, this is why like, you will never flush out the corruption from this system. Because it is so embedded, it is, it is just, it is cancer at the bone. I mean, you guys have no idea how many people at the tops of all of these organizations are controlled by this club or have been brainwashed by this club. You know, they don't have to buy out a lot of these people. They can just brainwash them with certain ideologies. You know, a lot of these people, they actually think that they're doing something good. So when they help in the extermination of humanity, when they help get the government more power, they see it as a good thing. And, you know, I mean, I can say a lot about that, but this is really important information. And when I learned about Tammany Hall in college, I was taught that they controlled basically all politics, not necessarily Tammany, but Tammany and all of their branch organizations that they were connected with, they controlled all politics like on the entire East Coast. I mean, they had control in multiple, multiple, multiple states. And then I'm sure that the states that they didn't have control in, they had other political machines controlling who were secretly in bed with them. You know, they might have had like fake dramas, like fake differences. But in reality, they're all connected. They're all part of the same club, or at least the same monster, the same beast. They're all different heads of the same beast. And this is historical fact. It is historical fact that this organization, this club, controlled politics in, the, in at least the Northeast for over 150 years. And now what's very interesting, going back to the police organizations, to these law enforcement organizations, I forgot to, to mention this just a little while ago. I wanted to mention it before when I was talking about the Irish immigrants. If you look at the NYPD flag, and the FDNY flag, I'll go over the NYPD flag first. It's obviously an Irish flag. And then the, the, the reasons that they give, the rhetoric that they have out there about why the flag looks the way it looks is ridiculous. Okay, so this is the NYPD flag. You can see the green colors. Green is usually associated with the Irish. But more specifically, you have a four-leaf clover right there on the flag made out of stars. Now, this is the FDNY flag. You also have a four-leaf clover. Now, let's look at the reason that they give for the NYPD flag. So, they say that the green on the NYPD flag actually comes from the lantern lights that the first NYPD officers used to carry around. Apparently, the, uh, the New Amsterdam Night Watchmen, the city's first paid police force, carried lanterns with green glass. Okay, so that's the excuse that they give for the green. How about the four-leaf clover? Well, this article here makes no mention of it. It says this. It has this mention of the, of the stars. It says, Our flag is modeled after the United States flag. The five white and green bars represent the boroughs of New York. I don't think that they do. I think that they represent the five crime families that you know the mafia gets its letters from. But I'm not gonna get, get, But I'm not going to go into that. While the 24 stars represent the disparate cities, towns, and villages incorporated into the city of New York in 1898. So they say the stars, the, the, the 24 stars, represent all of these different like towns and different cities and villages that make up the city of New York uh, in its totality. But they mention nothing about why those stars are organized in the shape of a four-leaf clover. Well, it's very simple. It was created, this well, not this flag in particular, but actually, well, when this flag was created, I'm sure, you know, the Irish still had total control over the NYPD. 
But regardless, the flag was created by a police force that has heavy, corrupt Irish roots. So of course they're going to put some Irish identifiers into the flag. It is proof of the corrupt origins or the corrupt roots of this police force. So let's return back to this New York Post article and see exactly what false flag they used to pass the New York gun laws. So in 1911, in the wake of a notorious Gramercy Park Blue Blood murder-suicide, Sullivan sponsored the Sullivan Act, which mandated police-issued licenses for handguns and made it a felony to carry an unlicensed concealed weapon. This was the heyday of the pre-prohibition gangs, roving bands of violent toughs who terrorized ethnic neighborhoods and often fought pitched battles with police. In 1903, the Battle of Rivington Street pitted a Jewish gang, the Eastmans, against the Italian Five Pointers. When the cops showed up, the two underworld armies joined forces and blasted away, resulting in three deaths and scores of injuries. The public was clamoring for action against the gangs. Problem was, the gangs worked for Tammany. The Democratic machine used them as starkers, or sluggers, enforcing discipline at the polls and intimidating the opposition. Gang leaders like Monk Eastman were even employed as informal sheriffs, keeping their turf under Tammany control. Okay, now, I, I gotta say a lot of things here. So the first thing is these starkers. When I heard that, I thought of stalkers, and I thought of gang stalking. What else I find interesting is that Tammany had such control over the police force that they actually had these gang leaders employed as informal sheriffs. I mean, like you have no idea how bad the history is. And this is a, a problem that I have with a lot of truthers today, is they make it like this corruption and this, all of this madness that's going on. They make it like it's new. They make it like it's, oh no, it's only something that's only occurred in the last couple of decades. Like Joe Rogan, I heard him say in a video like not too long ago, that he used to trust CNN. He's like, oh, what happened to CNN? I used to be able to listen to them. Okay, Joe Rogan used to believe that the moon landing wasn't real. So I really doubt that Joe Rogan actually used to listen to CNN and believe them. It's all part of this narrative that they use to control us and to enslave us mentally. I'll be getting into that in another video. So yeah, very interesting, the, this, this history. So now let's move on. The Tammany Tiger needed to rein in the gangs without completely crippling them. Enter Big Tim with the perfect solution. Ostensibly disarm the gangs and ordinary citizens too, while still keeping them on the streets. Now really the reality is, and the article's gonna confirm that, they knew the gangs weren't actually going to be disarmed. The truth is, is that they did this to disarm the citizens, and, it's going, and the article's gonna get into that right now, so let me just shut up. In fact, he gave the game away during the debate on the bill, which flew through Albany. Of course it flew through Albany, because you had a corrupt political machine in Albany too, remember? Quoting him now. I want to make it so the young thugs in my district will get three years for carrying dangerous weapons instead of getting a sentence in the electric chair a year from now. Basically, he wants to make it so that like um, they'll get charged for the firearm and not get charged for having a shootout with the citizen. Like, you know, if the citizen's armed, his gang member's armed, the, the citizen's gonna, you know, pull out a gun, then the gang member's gonna shoot and kill the citizen, and then the gang member will get the electric chair. So that's what he's getting at there. So really, he just wanted to disarm the citizen so that, you know, they're an easy target that's not gonna put up a fight and get themselves shot and killed. Like, this, this stuff is sick. Our history, the, the history of this country, and, and not just this country, but the history of this world politically is disturbing. Like, no Hollywood blockbuster can even come close to glimpsing the truth of the real tragedy that's going on. So anyway, let me continue. 
Sullivan knew the gangs would flout the law, but appearances were more important than results. Young toughs took to sewing the pockets of their coats shut so that cops couldn't plant firearms on them, and many gangsters stashed their weapons into their girlfriend's bird cages. This is a wire mesh fashion contraption around which women would wind their hair. So this is important. So now gang members that didn't want to be part of the, of the club, now they had to worry about cops planting guns on them and putting them in prison. So this gave this corrupt political machine power on multiple levels. Power against the citizen and power against other gang members that did not want to be part of their corrupt political machine. Ordinary citizens, on the other hand, were disarmed, which solved another problem. Gangsters had been bitterly complaining to Tammany that their victims sometimes shot back at them. See? There you go. Just completely disarming and disempowering the public. So gang violence didn't drop under the Sullivan Act and really took off after the passage of Prohibition in 1920. Spectacular gangland rubouts like the 1932 machine gunning of Mad Dog Cole in a drugstore phone booth on 23rd Street became the norm. Okay, so this didn't help at all. So then it goes on to say, Congressional hearings in the 1950s followed by the Fed's prolonged assault on the Mafia succeeded in tamping down traditional gangland violence, but guns are still easily available to criminals. So the article finishes off with, uh, with this. Meanwhile, savor the irony of an edict written by a corrupt politician to save his bad guys from the electric chairs, now being used against law-abiding citizens from other states. It was always used or intended to be used against law-abiding citizens. Doesn't matter whether they're from this state or visitors from another. And the rest of the story? Big Tim was already suffering from syphilis when he wrote his law. He went mad soon thereafter and was sent to a sanitarium in 1912. He eventually escaped. His severed body was found on, a, on railroad tracks in the Bronx in August 1913. The dedicated lifelong public servant left behind an estate valued at more than $2 million. Okay, so now I'm going to say a couple of things. Now this is going back to our constitution and the current system. So... It's crazy, at least I find it crazy, and I believe other people should also find it crazy, that it is well known, it is a historical fact, that this law was created out of corruption and intended for corrupt purposes, and were specifically intended to harm and to disempower law-abiding citizens. This is a historical fact, but yet nothing can be done. Nowhere in either of our constitutions, either the federal constitution or the state constitution, does it say that laws passed by corruption or laws intended to further corruption, nowhere in either of those constitutions does it say that corrupt laws are null and void. Well, we're, we're given two options. One, we have to rely on the courts, which have proven on multiple occasions to be just as corrupt and bought out. And two, the other option that we have is to use the same system that they used to pass their laws. Basically, we would have to use this democracy to then take these positions, these political positions, and then overturn these laws. Now, yeah, that sounds really easy, and it sounds like a fair game when you don't understand the history and when you don't understand just how much control and influence this group has. And yet yeah, had this control, like, you know, we looked at the control that the Tammany group had in the past, but they still have this control. It's just not so overt. They're much more covert with their operations now. So that's why I say we don't really have any options. And, and not only do these constitutions fail to protect us against such corrupt laws, but this system, this type of democracy, was used to push these laws. Tammany Hall, a big part of their, of their machine, was they gave jobs for votes. They gave bribes, they would give whatever for votes. 
and then they would get those votes and then they would use those votes to pass these corrupt laws and to empower themselves. So this whole system of voting, at least this current type of voting system, needs to be reformed. There needs to be something done on a constitutional level and on a democratic level, like on a level of how the system operates. And I'm sure that some people will say, well, if you fix the constitution side of it, then you don't have to worry about the democratic side of it. Or is it possible to create a system that uses multiple aspects of other systems? Like, can you have a system that at times doesn't use this system of voting, doesn't use this system of democracy, and functions well without it, and that at other times, it can call this tool of democracy forward. Like, we need to create a system that has multiple tools in the bag. Not a system that has one tool, and it's like, now, hey, guess what? You got to use that tool to fix all the problems. Because the problem with that sort of system that has only one tool is that if a corrupt group gets complete control over that tool, then we're screwed. There's nothing that we can really do. So I'm gonna end this video here. It's a really long video, but it's a really important video. And I just wanna quickly say, actually I'm gonna just finish off. I swear it's gonna be the last thing that I say. I'll end the video right after I say it. I won't even say my farewells at the end like I normally do. The other thing I wanna say, and I'm gonna be making a separate video on this, is that this is why these protests, what these, uh, what these truckers are doing in Canada and any of these other protests, they're not gonna work. Okay, they, they might create some sort of temporary relief. Maybe they'll work temporarily, but the system isn't broken. It was made this way. Going all the way back to the creation of the Constitution, the US Constitution at least, it has been corrupt from the beginning. It wasn't broken. It was made this way. And people need to realize that. And we need to have a real, I don't want to say revolution, but we need to have a real shift in consciousness that will allow us to not have to be ruled by corrupt pieces of trash.